Well, if you take your Bibles, if you have them, and turn to Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3. If not, it's going to be on the screens, or there's some Bibles below your seats. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called Becoming Who We Are, as we look at this letter that Paul wrote. And uh, if you weren't here last week, um, you didn't miss much, so I'm going to give you the cliff notes, and I'm going to tie it all together from last week to this week. But we were in Ephesians 2, and, and here was the scripture in verse 13. It said, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. What he says was you were alienated, and now you've been reconciled. You were once far away, and you were brought near. And if you remember, we talked about there were two groups that he was preaching to at this moment. There were the Jews and the Gentiles, and there was this huge dividing wall between them. And they were not in the same camp, and they were not um, really living in a way that would honor God together. And Paul comes and he says, listen... Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. And here's what he's done to the two opposites. He's made the two groups one, and he's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and its regulations. He said, you were once separated. And you Jewish people from Israel, you were the chosen one, but now know that because of Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross, everybody... Uh, is included. There is a new humanity. I'm not just creating a new person, but a new humanity. And there's going to be a new way in which we're going to live and in which we're going to operate. And when people see us unified together, that the world could be changed. And he said, I'm going to do this between Jew and Gentile, and it's going to be for everyone that comes after them. And he said, that dividing wall is gone. And we just said it like this, that unity through diversity within community is the unifying picture that reflects Jesus' love and transforms the world. And I challenged us as a church that if the Jews and the Gentiles, as much as they hated each other and there was a dividing wall, that God broke that down by the power of his spirit, that all the things that sometimes divide us within the church, that we got to figure out that we could actually live together in unity, that it would be such a great reflection to a world that needs to hear and understand the love of Jesus Christ, that amongst our diversity, that we could come together and understand there is this one, his name Jesus, and he shed his blood for all of us. We're broken people in a broken world that need a great Savior. And today, we celebrate that and we give thanks for that. And as we started thinking about this section and next week, our team came together. And when you walked in, um, you received a, a little card. And I'd love for you to take it out. I'm going to ask you to do two things at once. I'm going to ask you to write and I'm going to ask you to listen. Some of you don't do very good at that. I do. I'm ADD. It'll be perfect for me. I can write and listen and do something else at the same time. But here's what we need you to do. This is for next week's sermon. You're going to turn it in, and you're not going to give it to the person that you're going to write a thank you to. But if you go to church here, you're a family member of this place, or there's somebody in your life that, that, that you've just not thanked, that maybe they've made an impact on you. Maybe they've done something kind for you. Maybe they brought a meal to your home or your husband or your wife. Maybe they served alongside of you. We want you to write just a note of affirmation and say thank you, Diane, Linda, Bob, John, whatever it is, and just write on there why you are thankful for them. Next week, it'll make more sense. I have no idea what we're going to do with it, but they tell me it's going to be really cool, so we're doing it next week, and I'm excited. So fill this out. At the end of the service, we're going to collect them. Let's just come by and collect them. So if you would do that, I would greatly appreciate that. As we look forward this morning, if there is one thing I want you to remember out of this sermon for the next 30 minutes or so, it is this, that when God has his rightful place, all else falls into place. When God has his rightful place in your life, all else falls into place. Doesn't mean everything will be perfect. Doesn't mean the road will be straight. But it means that when we put God first, not just here in this life, but for eternity, he said all things will be put into place one day. And Paul comes and he says, I need you to understand and trust me, out of all that was going on in the diversity, I need you to understand that God was creating this new humanity. And he comes in verse 14 and he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
If you've been here a while, you know those last two verses are my favorite two verses in the Bible. That we serve a God who can do immeasurably more than we ever ask or think. Yet as I look back, I had never done a sermon on this passage. And I could preach on those two verses forever, but it's the ones that precede it that gave me a little bit of trouble because it is dense and it is deep, and so we're going to dive right in. Let me ask you, have you ever been distracted when you pray? Anybody ever been distracted when you pray? Man, when you're just driving down the road and you start praying, and, or when you're sitting at home and you think this is just going to be a moment between me and God, and you start praying, and boom, you're off somewhere else, and your mind's wandering, and you're thinking. I think the same thing happened to Paul. If you look at the chapter 3, verse 1, he starts out and he says, for this reason. And then he goes into a whole section about the mystery of God and all these things. And for 13 verses, he just rambles on. It was like he was praying and then he went, oh, a bird. And he saw the bird and then he just took off and he just started on something else. And then he comes back and the first thing he says right here is he says this in verse 14, for this reason. And we're back again, right where he started. I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. That might not be very significant for you and for me, but it was pretty significant for the Jewish listener when he says, I I kneel, because in Jewish culture, they didn't kneel. They usually stand, and you've seen pictures of those at the Great Wall or the Wailing Wall, and they stand, and they pray, and they bow, and they rock, or excuse me, they stand, and they rock, and they aren't accustomed to someone bowing, but Paul comes, and, and he says, I bow my knee before God. See, he He postures himself with reverence and readiness. He puts himself in a humble position to not only obey God, but actually to hear from God. He is on his knees out of dependence, I believe, but respect and honor for the realization of what he's been talking about in this letter. I think there is something in him that goes, I can't do what you've asked me to do, God, on my own, so I'm getting down on my knees in humble obedience to you because you're going to try and bring these two people groups together, and you're going to try and create one humanity, and you're going to have to show up in my life as I lead them where you want me to lead them, and in humble obedience, he gets on his knees. I think the second thing is he is just blown away by who God is and who he isn't. He has a realization, and he understood that when God has his rightful place, all else falls into play. When's the last time you've been on your knees? When's the last time you've positioned yourself to hear from God? And in humble obedience, she said, God, you're God, and I'm not, and I have no idea what to do, but I am trusting in you. When's the last time you walked out and thought to yourself, man, the God I serve is awesome. I love the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40. He said, lift up your eyes and look to the heaven. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Because there's smog or the haze in the air, there's a lot of stars that miss around here, but I don't know if you've been out lately in the last few nights and you look up, man, there were stars everywhere. And he says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and remind yourself today who created these. There is one God. Paul says, I bowed my knee to him from which every name in heaven and earth is derived. Paul comes and and it's the same thing to us. See, Paul had to step aside so God could actually step up. Paul had to get out of the way and humble himself so God could actually step in and do something. And he was calling on him. And by faith, he said, God, I need you to be God in my life and do what only you can do. He positioned himself to hear from God. And for us today, if you want to know God and you want to hear God and you want God to work through you, you need to position yourself to be used by God. And that position is one of humble dependence upon him and acknowledgement that he is and you're not. And that is the beginning of where God wants all of us to be. And he starts here in verse 14, and he continues on through verse 16. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Paul says, listen, everybody, my father has inexhaustible resources at his disposal, and they are for you. My God is the one who supplies out of his abundance of riches. To the church in Rome, chapter 11, he wrote it this way, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable is judgment and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, he asked? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And he says, God is God. And here is what I want you to know and understand. And he begins out of this prayer. I pray out of his glorious abundance of riches that there are four things I really want you to know. And it's sort of like a staircase that builds on one another. And so out of that, he said, followers of Jesus, here's what I want you to know. And here's who I hope you would be. I hope you would be strengthened with power through his spirit. Rooted and established in love. I hope you would be experiencing Christ's love that surpasses knowledge And that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul says all these things come out of the wealth of our Heavenly Father. And so he talks first and he says this. That you would be strengthened with power through His Spirit. That's an inward transformation he talks about. So he starts inwardly. And his request in chapter 1 was that people would understand the wisdom and know God and His great power and find hope in that. His prayer here in chapter 3 is that they would actually experience God through Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed and the Spirit of God that lives within them. 2 Corinthians 4.16, he talks about it this way. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're kind of wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you are honest? (laughs) When you look in the mirror or you go to the gym or you do something as you're getting older, you look in, you just, you, you've lost a little heart about what's going on on the outside. Anybody lose a little heart? I mean, all of us, we probably lose a little heart when we look and we say, man, not what I used to be. I don't feel like I used to feel, can't do what I used to do. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I got to go uh, up to the mountains with some of my friends that are here today, and we went skiing. And it was awesome. So I have this little blue band that travels with me now so I can stretch. You know, I've got to stretch my legs and my arms and my back. And I went skiing, man. We skied the whole day in June Mountain. It was awesome. Came back, woke up the next morning, wasn't sore at all. It was great. Then we went snowmobiling the next day. That was even better. I stretched out, felt really good. Then it was a Sunday, and we were going to drive back early. And I had a, a baby dedication at somebody's house, and then Anaheim Church was launching. And we got like two and a half feet of snow, and we got snowed in. And so we couldn't leave. They closed the roads. And so our cars were kind of covered and closed in. So we went out to shovel snow. And I went out to shovel snow and I threw out my back shoveling snow. It was awesome. (laughs) Went in, I sat down, I couldn't get up. The guys went out. They were thinking they were going to go on the mountain to ski. And they got there and it was closed. They couldn't ski. And I was just sitting at home by myself and put some ice on it. Got a little massage later. And then the next morning I woke up. I still was not good. We go out to the car. And uh, we had dug out, but guess what? We had a flat tire. Yeah, and it was minus five degrees. <clears throat> That's what it said on the car. So my buddy Chuck, <laughs> he's driving. He had to get out and go change the tire. And I just sat in the warm car with my pillow behind me, and I just sat back, and I just watched him change the tire. It was awesome. I am so glad I got hurt. You did a great job, Chuck. That was great. Thank you. And I thought to myself later, I said, it was about nine or ten days before I was able to go off or go to the gym or really just operate. And I thought to myself, man, I got to do the right things for my physical body to get back in shape. I can't rush it. I got to take care of it now that I'm 50. Got to do things different than I used to do. And Paul comes along and he says, listen, I need you to be strengthened and understand something. That it's the same thing in your spiritual life with your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's day by day, moment by moment. And inwardly, he says, you could be being transformed and growing stronger and stronger and closer to God, but it's going to take a life of dedication, and it's going to take a life of surrender unto God. And Paul comes, and he says, listen, here's my prayer for you, that you would be strengthened with power through his spirit, and that God would do something, because we are frail containers, but he says, we are pulsating with divine power. We are jars of clay that could be fading away, but yet God lives and dwells within us, and we have his spirit, and the spirit of God is the power of God that works through the people of God. 
And he comes along and I say out of his glorious riches, verse 16, that you would have this power through his spirit in your inner being. Well, why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's two ancient words that conveyed what they were trying to say here when they talked about dwelling within. One has the idea of living in a place uh, as a stranger. The other has an idea of settling down, that this was becoming a permanent residence. Paul says Jesus is coming and he's making a permanent residence in you. That he is settling down, he's making a home. And he is going to live now in you and through you. And Paul is saying this is part of the mystery that we don't understand at all, but God, through his son Jesus, has come, and now we have the chance inwardly to be transformed. And he starts out and he says, when God has his rightful place in your life, all else falls into place. So the first step is inward. Then he says, I want you to be rooted and established in love, and that's what outwardly happens as you inwardly begin to be transformed by God. He said that you would be rooted and established. Rooted, it's an agricultural term. Established or founded is an architectural term. And they run perfectly parallel together. He says, sort of like trees, our lives are to send down roots that are deep and wide in the soil of love. And like buildings, the core of our lives here on earth are to have deep foundational truths that come forward that is based upon God's love living in and through us. And he goes, if we're properly rooted, and if we're properly constructed on this foundation of love, nothing will be able to shake us. It was huge for this new humanity. It was huge for this wall that was now broken down. And he comes and he says, listen, inwardly you can be renewed by Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit. Outwardly, I'm looking for you to come together in love. And in verse 17, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So now he says, followers of Jesus, you should be experiencing Christ's love that surpasses knowledge. This is when you look upward and you realize that there is a God that loves you and cares for you, that you experience his love. And it is wide, it is long, it is high, and it is deep. A commentator said it like this. He said, it's a love which is wide enough to embrace the world. John three sixteen. most of us know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world. But he actually came into the world to save them. That he came to save you, not condemn you. And he loved you. And his love is wide enough to embrace the world. It's a love which is long enough, he says, to last forever. Great theologian Charles Spurgeon said this, It is so long that your old age cannot wear it out. So long your continual tribulation cannot exhaust it. Your successive temptation shall not drain it dry. Like eternity, it knows no bounds. It's a love which is long enough to last forever. It is a love which is high enough to take sinners to heaven. And it is a love which is deep enough to stoop to the depths and save the lowest of sinners. And he says, this is the love of your God. It's never ending. It's deep. It's high. It's long. It's wide. And he says, out of all of that, lastly, I want you to have the power with all the Lord's people to be able to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Think about it. His language is is a little bit confusing. Because how do you personally know something that is beyond knowing? You can't really do it. But I think Paul wasn't just talking about your head knowledge here. I think what he was saying is, I want this to be something that you experience. I want this not to just be about knowledge in your head, but a heart transformation. And that experience comes in knowing and seeing the power of God at work in community. You see, following Jesus wasn't meant to be done in isolation, but it was meant to be done in collaboration. It was meant to be done together. That's why when we're connected in community, that's what's going to lead to a deeper understanding and commitment to Jesus. And from being connected and committed together, then Jesus' love compels us to go forward and change the world. And Paul comes and he says, corporately, I want you to understand and know the knowledge that passes all of your knowledge. And you can't know it just on your own. And what he's saying there is, when we come together as the community of Christ, there's sometimes in your life you feel like prayers have gone unanswered. 
You feel like God is not doing anything in your life, but when you sit with somebody and you hear their story, or you see a story of life being transformed, or you come to church and you watch somebody get baptized, that their life has been changed, there's something that's happening in the community that encourages you and spurs you on and draws you to Jesus and reminds you that he is still God and he is still in control of everything. And Paul says here, I want you to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit inwardly. I want you to be rooted and established in love outwardly. I want you to experience Christ's love that surpasses knowledge upwardly. And I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God as you go onward and as you live your life each and every day. In Colossians, he talks about the fullness of God. And he said, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. That God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It's kind of deep theologically, so I want to simplify it for you. If today, this afternoon, you were going to go down to the Pacific Ocean, and you were going to go and and stand on the shores, and you were to look out or maybe take a walk, I don't know about you, but when you stood there, you're just kind of a little blip (laughs) when you look out at that vast sea. You realize how just massive it is and how small you are. But if, if you were to take uh, this jar and you were to bend down and you were to let water rush into it, in an instant, this jar would be filled to overflowing. But think about it. As it was overflowing, I could never put the fullness of the Pacific Ocean into my jar. See, as as I look at this, all of it's still there. You just took a little bit, but you were filled. But it wouldn't take the fullness of the Pacific Ocean to do that. Because Christ is infinite. Think about that. That means he's unlimited, he's boundless, he's endless. He can hold all the fullness of deity of his heavenly Father, the supreme being in divine character and in nature. But whenever one of his finite creations, that's you and that's me, when we dip the tiny vessel of our life into Him, we instantly become full of His fullness. And the more we receive, the more we can yet receive. And see, this is going to be our experience in eternity as our souls will be loaded with the fullness of God, integrated to more and more of Him. And in this, as we look at it, He continually gives you more. And Paul says, I want you to know the fullness of God. It is never ending. How long, how wide, how deep, how high. And the more you get, the more you're able to receive. When we were up in the chapel, we used to sing a song that said, more love, more power, more of you in my life. And Paul comes and says, you're never going to be able to grasp it, understand it, or take it all in. But I promise you, you have the fullness of God at your disposal. And out of this high theology, he comes to the high praise and the doxology as he ends. And he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love that because he says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we, than we ask according to his power that is at work within us. Him be glory in the church. I think there's something to it. We cannot grasp the immeasurable of God without every individual. And when we come together, like I said earlier, there is something that God does, and we get to see His immeasurable work going on in a community of believers. And I think He was talking to all of us as the church that when we come together, we have a chance to see God move in ways we never could on our own. And power flows as we are intimate with God and as we walk with Him. But when you come together as God's church, He says, can you imagine what can be done? He says, I want the world to see this love, and I don't want it to be just about now. I want it to be about future generations. And if we're about Jesus and his business, then we will be about what lives on beyond us. So let me close. What does it mean for all of us today? What does it mean for you and me? Well, here's what I think for some of us. I think some of us serve a God that is way too small in our life. I think for some of us, we have expected little from him, or we are not engaged with him. And Paul comes and he says, I'm giving you an opportunity to experience God's might, God's power, and God's love. And when our spirit aligns with the spirit of God, his his power begins to work in and through us. And I think some of us serve a God that's too small. I love 
that he says, I'm going to do immeasurably more. And I still believe today that he is the God that wants to do immeasurably more in us and through us. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe in a God who out of his glorious riches is able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine? And some of you might say yes, but let me ask you again, are you living like it? Personally, in your life, what is God asking you to do and who is he asking you to be? I've said this before, but if your vision isn't intimidating to you, then it's probably insulting to God. Do you have a personal vision for what God wants to do in your life and through your life? And if it's to be comfortable and to hang out and to gain more knowledge and just to attend church, then I just want to tell you that's probably a little small. (laughs) But when you step out in great faith and you do things that God has called you to do and people think you're crazy, then you're probably in the right place. If you step out and it's really uncomfortable and you've never done it before, then you're probably in the right place. I told the last service, I said, I had no idea when we decided that we were going to plant the Orange Campus five years ago, what would happen? I just knew God was calling us to do it, and I knew Jay Hewitt was the right person to do it. And when he said no, then he prayed a little bit more, and then God led in his heart. Last week, they crossed over the 600-person barrier um, for the first time. They had over 600 people at that campus. How awesome is that? And I started looking at that campus now. You could have never told me that five years ago that I walked in that campus on Monday and I toured that campus with somebody, one of my friends, and I showed him all that God's doing over there. And six years ago, that was nothing. And there was a family here last night that chose to get up out of these seats and leave and go with Jay and Natalie and start that church. And they're now getting ready to move to Louisiana because he had a job transfer. And they were here last night, and next week's going to be their last week at Orange, and and I'm going to be speaking there next week, and and they're going to be there for the last time before they move. And I gave them a hug, and I just said, Orange would not have happened without you. Nancy Foster gave 40 hours a week as the executive director over there. She used to work for United Way. She was the president of United Way for the state of Texas. She volunteered 40 hours because she didn't need to get paid. That building... Everything we have over there, it's because Nancy came alongside of Jay and did what God called her to do. And it was way bigger than she could have ever imagined. And she sat there and cried last night. And she says, we feel like we're leaving undone business. And I said, no, you're not. You're just opening the door for somebody to get off their butt, out of their seat, and actually do something for God now. It is now their time. You gave your time. Now go to Louisiana. I have no idea why you're moving to Louisiana. But God bless you as you're there. And we can't wait to see you when you come back. But somebody's going to have to step up and in their place. And I have people that come over to me and they go, we want the Orange Campus. That's what we want. And I'm like, no, you don't. You have no idea what it's taken for six years for that to get where it is and what God did every step of the moment. You don't want a brain tumor like Jay. (laughs) You don't want to go through all the stuff he's gone through to get to the other side. Unless... Unless you're going to believe in a God that's going to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask or think and it's taking you out of the comfort zone and you know if you don't do it, you are out of the will of God. And he comes and he says, listen, church, if your vision is intimidating you, it's probably insulting to God. We have two values that our staff that we try and live by. The first one is risk evasion. I told you before we made up that word. It's in the dictionary now, but it's really cool. Risk evasion, risking everything to follow God with courageous innovation. That we're going to step out. And that's why we started Anaheim. Intentional pursuit. We are passionately reaching out to those who don't follow Jesus. We believe 8,001 people are going to come to know Jesus through this church. Why do we plant a church in Anaheim? You know how many churches there are in Anaheim? I don't either, but there are a lot of them. (laughs) And the last thing we probably need was another church, but here's what I know. 350,000 people live in Anaheim. 70% or so claim that they are not followers of Jesus Christ. So we said, we're going to go to Anaheim. And we're going to take David Heim, and we're going to take an Amigos congregation, and we're going to launch something new. Is it going to work? I have no idea. But I'm believing God's going to show up like he showed up in orange. And one step at a time, one person at a time, we're going to go for it. And you 100 people that committed to join me, come tonight because I'm preaching with David, and we're preaching a different service. Love to see you there. 5 o'clock, join us. And it is going to be awesome because I think God's going to do something. George, our pastor of our Amigos congregation, started the Anaheim campus for Amigos. Second week in, 
I challenged our staff Tuesday to step out and take some risks. I said, some of you have been pretty comfortable. And I said, it's time to get out and, and fail a little bit. It's okay. It's not going to be a failure. We're going to do things around here with excellence. But when God calls us, we're going to move. So George, he's an activator. He felt like God was calling him to this mobile home park to start a Bible study in Anaheim. And he started because he had a couple people that lived there in this mobile home park. They had 29 people that came to the first study. Couldn't fit in the mobile home. How awesome is that? That's really cool. But it gets better. So George then, he's the activator. So he's like, I got to have a new place. So he talked to Lulu, who runs the whole mobile home park. They have a brand new remodeled clubhouse. Lulu said, he said, can I rent it from you? And she said, no, but you can have it. So every Tuesday night, she's booked it out. And then she said, would you guys do an event here on Easter? And would you do an event on Mother's Day? And then George says, well, since we're doing that, can we do it with our family fun fest on October 31st? And she said, yes. George said, awesome. And then two days later, George goes back to have a meeting with her because, listen, Lulu is connected to the owners of this mobile home park, but they don't just own one. They own 200. So now George is having a meeting with the other 199 of them. How is he going to do it? I have no idea. But he took a challenge to get out of his seat. And when God led him, he just went and started a Bible study and he overflowed a mobile home. And now he's taking the next step. And I don't know what God's going to do, but I've already seen him do immeasurably more. The question is, is that the God you serve? So as we close today, does God have his rightful place in your life? Does he have his rightful place? If he doesn't, only you can change it. And some of you might have to step aside so God can actually step up. That you allow him to step up in your life and lead it. And then, by faith, you step out and be all that God called you to be. Paul came and he said, I bowed the knee, but I'm going to seek his kingdom first. And all these other things will be added. And the last question, how are you helping the next generation find their place in this place? We have a value called deliberate apprenticeship that we are purposely training others in the knowledge and skills and opportunities that have been entrusted to us. For me, I started looking around. When Jay Hewitt became a senior pastor, I think he was 29 years old. When Chris Ward became our teaching pastor, he was 30. Dave Heim just left junior high to start Anaheim. He's 35. Mother and daughter are hanging out up here today singing. All of that's on purpose. Because I want to put people in places in the next generation that's beyond them. But they're going to be cheered on by us that are older. When I'm the old guy now hanging out in our staff, I look around, good grief, there's only a couple that are older than me. And I look around and I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> because they're the church of today. And they're the church of tomorrow. And if we don't give them a place, they're not going to have a place. Our nurseries are busting. It should excite you. It should fire you up. And when the young people get up here, us old people, we're going to get up here and make mistakes. But when they get up here and they make mistakes, you should cheer them on. They should know that you are in their corner because we are deliberately giving them leadership opportunities to prepare this church for the days when we are not here. Because when you live for Jesus, you live beyond yourself and you live for him. So what are you doing for that next generation? I don't know what it is, but we got opportunities all over the place for them to be used and to be mentored and to be loved and to be cared for. And if you're just sitting on the sidelines, can I ask you, maybe it's time to step in, step up. When God has his rightful place, all else falls into place. May we be a church that positions ourselves to hear from God. And then may we be a church that actually moves out in faith and does what he calls us to do.